afternoon and welcome to the Thought Leadership event series number 24. The topic is Nothing Really Happened, Exploring Sexual Harassment in the Legal Profession. Today we are pleased to present Dr. Ashley Gore, a lecturer in Criminology at Western University. Dr. Gore's research focuses on gendered violence, particularly violence against women, and the social, cultural, and legal constructions of responsibility. In this session, Dr. Gorn will discuss her research on women's experiences of sexual harassment in the legal profession and its impact on their career paths. Her work highlights the pervasive nature of sexual harassment in the Australian legal industry where one in four women experience such harassment, often leading to high attrition rates. Dr. Go argues that the traditional incident-based model of understanding workplace harassment fails to capture the full spectrum of gendered and sexualized violations women face. She advocates for a broader approach that considers the continuum of sexual violence and its implications for justice in the legal profession. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ashley Goff. Thank you. Over to you, Ashley. Hi everybody, there's a small group in the room, so hi friends, um, and hi everybody online. Um, I would also just like to do a quick shout out to um, my colleague, Dr. Shima Shabazi. Uh, so this project did start off as an ECR funded grant, but now it's turning into a co-published article that my colleague Shima has really been helping me work through. Um, and I believe she's teaching today as well, so I don't think she's uh, online. Okay. So as I already said, uh, the seed for this project uh, was an ECR grant, but where it started for me uh, was the heightened publicity for workplace sexual harassment in the wake of the Me Too movement, but more specifically with revelations in 2020 of the extensive levels of sexual harassment in the legal profession. And you can see just some snapshot uh, media headlines on the slides up here outlining some aspects of the legal industry's me Too moments in Australia. Some of the biggest ones here were a former High Court judge, Hayden Dyson, um, being found to have uh, consistently harassed at least six women across the course of their early career. So as a quick snapshot, here's what we already knew. One in four women in the legal profession experience sexual harassment, and this is a conservative number. Uh, substantial numbers of women uh, as law students also encounter gender bias and sexual harassment at the hands of both faculty and other students. We know that they rarely report harassment for various reasons, including fear of repercussions, and we know that the attrition rate of women lawyers is very high, and that this is very damaging and costly for individuals, for law firms, and for the standing of the legal profession, as well as for gender equality as a whole. And so why was I uh, interested in this? Um, well, a couple of reasons, but I was a law student at one point in my life. Uh, I thought better of it and changed course. Um, but in hindsight, some of the cultures that I had been exposed to on my legal placements felt like a bit of a near miss. Uh, and in conversation with colleagues and old friends of mine from law school, something that did irk me was the attrition rate of young women from law school and from the legal profession. And many of the young women I went to law school with did not pursue or did not stay uh, in legal practice for various reasons. But more broadly, I'm interested in the, in the way that law as an institution also responds to women as victims and survivors of gendered violence. And so for me, there's an ideological and a practical stake here in the attrition of young women from law and how this can impact justice for other women turning to the law. And so I wanted to understand these things better and to look at how these experiences affect women's pathways into the legal profession and their decisions to leave it. So um, in terms of what we already knew, the current Australian data on sexual harassment is largely survey-based, with some exceptions, but it tends to cover the prevalence and the types of sexual harassments uh, and the reporting pathways that are available, um, which is fine, but there's a real gap in qualitative research. So I wanted to step away from survey-based research 
and I did some in-depth qualitative interviews with a, a smaller number of young women. So we took a broad feminist, socio-cultural and intersectional approach and we aimed to look at the lived experience of sexual harassment in the legal profession, how current, former and emerging legal professional women interpreted sexual harassment and interrogate the role that it's played in women's pathways in and out and throughout the legal profession. So we did interviews with 10 women in 2021, which I know is not a very big number, but it was exploratory, not representative. Um, and we spoke to current legal professionals, former legal professionals, and students as well. But importantly, these categories often overlapped. So for example, there were a lot of students who were already doing some capacity of work in the legal profession. Of the current practitioners that I spoke to, they were characteristically early career young women. They had worked uh, at a range of different types of legal workplaces, including community legal centres, boutique private law firms, commercial and corporate companies, and legal departments uh, in organisations like banks and the finance sector. And I also spoke to former legal practitioners. So in particular, two women that I spoke to had already left the legal profession at the time of reaching out to me for interviews. And again, they were characteristically very young in the early stages of their career when they left. And a third contacted uh, us after the interview to say that she'd also made the decision to leave. And part of that was the reflection that she'd engaged in when she did the interview with us and how that, that led to her making some connections and some observations about the problems in the culture um, that she maybe hadn't thought too deeply about before that. So starting to set out the findings, and here's where it started to get um, a little bit complicated for me. So I set out to talk to women about sexual harassment in the legal profession. But the experiences they wanted to talk to me about were not just in the legal profession um, and were not just sexual harassment. So it got a little bit complicated. So they wanted to talk to me about, yes, experiences in the legal profession, but also about their experiences in personal life and the university. And more importantly, they wanted to tell me about experiences that they didn't think met the threshold of legal sexual harassment. And so a question I've been grappling with ever since is what is it that they were trying to convey to me? What is a name that we can give to these experiences when they don't fit under a legal definition of sexual harassment? And these were law students and legal practitioners that were very well, well schooled in what the law says is legal harassment. So a common thread that ran through nearly every interview was the caveat um, that I might not be interested in their story, they would tell me, because nothing really happened in terms of sexual harassment, except that in every case something did happen, something distressing really had happened to them. But they were drawing an arbitrary line between their definition of sexual harassment, which, as I said, was couched uh, in legal definitions that they had been schooled in uh, and standards such as what a reasonable person would interpret as being sexual harassment and then their own experiences and how they felt. So they wanted to talk about experiences that they knew made them feel uncomfortable, that they thought might be unethical, but they didn't fit, think fit the script of sexual harassment or direct discrimination. And for them, harassment referred to an identifiable incidence, but it excluded the more everyday, almost mundane forms of gendered and sexualized practices that they experienced as harassing. And so they would just say, well, nothing really happened. And so this became the title of my presentation, yeah, Nothing Really Happened. Um, and this is also an ode to some of my favorite feminist scholars, which is Kelly and Radford, who 30 years ago wrote a paper also titled Nothing Really Happened, The Invalidation of Women's Experiences of Sexual Violence. And they also found that women say nothing really happened uh, as a frequent remark when they're talking about their experiences of intrusion. And we know that these minimizations are common in research with women who experience violence and harassment. And to quote Kelly and Radford again, these accounts all show that nothing happens on a very regular basis. So in the interviews, and we can sort of see this depicted on the slide here, they described continuums ranging from everyday intrusions that were really difficult for them to name to some more overt types of harassment, and some even did describe some very extreme experiences of sexual assault. But they also described a continuum um, of these experiences across different sites, so ranging from personal life to the law school to the legal profession.
And what was really important here in their accounts was noting that these weren't linear, separate experiences. Rather, these experiences overlapped and were really hard for them to disentangle. And therefore, it's really hard for them to see discrete incidents of sexual harassment. And so it made sense to draw on Kelly, again, you can tell she's one of my favourite scholars, Kelly's daughter framework of what she calls the continuum of sexual violence. So this is a really seminal piece of feminist research um, on women's experiences. So Kelly uses the continuum of sexual violence uh, in two sort of lay meaning ways. She describes it first as referring to the basic common character that underlines many different events. And secondly, as a continuous series of elements or events that pass into one another and cannot be readily distinguished. And this meaning points us to the common character that underlines different experiences, even if it wasn't obvious sexual harassment. The second meaning enables us to document and name a range of these less obvious forms of intrusion, coercion, and compliance as being connected on a spectrum of behaviour to those more obvious kinds of abuses. And so for Kelly, then, the concept of a continuum shows us that in abstract, we can easily draw these lines between harassment, not harassment, and normal and abhorrent behaviour. They actually shade into each other in ways that are really difficult um, for victims to disentangle. And so thinking about this continuum for me helps to try and frame these life course experiences that sat outside of the legal profession and think about how um, they were sort of coalescing with each other. And so experiences outside the legal profession, again, on face value, might seem really irrelevant to a study that was on harassment in the legal profession. Um, but what these participants were telling me is that these other things had a formative impact. Things that were happening in personal life when they were younger, in the law school, when they were studying, were sending them coded messages about responsibility and blame and accountability. And then this starts to feed into uh, some of the themes on the next slide. So one of the most common underlying characters of their narratives overall was a persistent feeling of invalidation across each of those sites. So in personal life, the law school, and then in professional life later on. Many of the women that I spoke to, for them it was not just the experience itself, but the invalidation of those around them, including friends, co-workers, family, and professional staff who either witnessed and did nothing or acted as though the behaviour was normal. Some examples here include earlier experiences of street harassment as young women. Uh, so here one law student was reflecting on a time when a man followed her home from school in his car and she was deeply intimidated and said that she still to this day remembers his license plate. But when her dad reported the man to the police, they said that they couldn't do anything. And then likewise, a different law student recounted that she reported sexual harassment from another law student to a university counsellor and was told that she could jeopardise his visa if she formally reported, and so she just didn't. And so these accounts reflect themes of both a sense of institutional betrayal, which is the failure of key institutions like your university or the police to act supportively in response to a disclosure, as well as feelings of invalidation. And in connecting the personal experience of invalidation to the macro socio-political conditions that enable gender-based violence, um, another scholar who was actually my PhD supervisor, Michael Salter, says that invalidation is a pervasive manifestation of gender relations as expressed through strategies of minimization, disbelief and denial. It's embedded in interpersonal and institutionalized arrangements and interactions. Invalidation serves to inscribe gender relations upon the bodies of women through the mental and physical health deficits of gender-based violence that it enables and facilitates. And this is what was reflected in the narrative of a third woman, woman sorry, quoted here on the slide, who described a culture of invalidation built into her workplace where women don't speak up. And the effect of this, she said, was that she suffered fatigue and anxiety and career burnout. When it came to experiences they described in the workplace itself, so in the legal profession, participants spoke less of sexualized experiences, um, but instead they spoke of other more broader things that were perceived as troubling because they were more everyday. So when discussing perceptions of sexual harassment, one of, the, one of my participants said, I've always almost expected to feel a hand on my ass at some point, 
And I've always been ready for that, you know, if that makes sense. So I've gone in prepared for those environments. And then this made it difficult to understand the actual behaviour that she encountered, which was not so obvious. And this was echoed by another participant, um, which is called S on the slides, who described a range of gendered experiences. And you can see some of these on, on the slide. And here the prevailing view of sexual harassment, which views unwanted sexual attention as the quintessential form of harassment, was predominantly how these young women thought. They thought that's what sexual harassment looks like, and so if my experience doesn't fit that, it's not harassment. So they didn't think that their experiences fit this script. And so for a while I started to turn to the term gender harassment instead, which is a form of hostile environment harassment that appears to be motivated by hostility towards individuals who violate gender ideals rather than um, by desire for those who meet them. And this can include a, a broad range of behaviours aimed not at sexual cooperation but to convey insulting, hostile and degrading attitudes about women. So here, where sexual harassment involves unwelcome and unreciprocated behaviours aimed at establishing some kind of sexual relationship, in contrast, gender harassment communicates hostility that's devoid of sexual interest. And so these behaviours differ from unwanted sexual attention in that they aim to insult and reject women, not to pull them into sexual relationships. So in other words, the difference um, between unwanted sexual attention and coercion versus harassment is analogous to the difference between a come on versus a put down. And some studies have found that this type of gender harassment is the most common form of harassment that women experience in the legal profession. But again, the participants, uh, in terms of what they were describing to me, I think challenged this assumption that the harassment was intended to drive women out or that the harassment was couched in stereotypes about uh, women's unsuitability for employment in the legal profession. Um, in fact, one of the participants quoted on this slide, S, she actually noted that her entire firm, except for the principal uh, solicitor, was made up of women. Um, and she described his hiring practices in, in great detail. She says it was absolutely a power and control issue. He would make statements um, about the fact that he only hired women. He hired uh, teen, fresh, teens fresh out of high school and would say the boys in comparison are just not worth hiring. Uh, they just don't do the work, the work well and that women do the best work. And she said there was this really weird contradiction where he would rant on all the time about how women were the cause of all the problems in the world, but that he wouldn't hire men because men just don't get the job done, um, which was also, she said, it was weirdly self-hating of him. So it was sometimes clearly not sexual harassment, but also not quite clearly gendered harassment either in the sense that there wasn't an attempt here to drive women out. There was actually a direct attempt to hire specifically women, um, but in a way that was clearly exploitative in some ways. In other comments, participants uh, described situations that portrayed not just hostility to women um, as would be expected in the gender harassment literature, but something that was quite a little bit more complicated, I thought. So one participant uh, described her experience at work as feeling like she was, quote, unquote, walking on eggshells. And so we've more aptly termed this working on eggshells here, given the context that she shared. So participants here used phrases like, it wasn't a specific experience um, as a whole. It was more of a pattern of behaviours. And it was down to what I was wearing. I felt so overtly controlled by him, him being the principal solicitor. Um, and every day I felt ridiculously scrutinised, every single action, down to the way I wrote notes, the way I dressed, the way I did my work on my computer. It was incredibly controlling. We were all expected to make him copy, to make him breakfast, to dress a certain way, to wear heels to work. And so these experiences, again, don't fit either sexual harassment or gendered harassment, which is premised on the rejection of women from the workforce. So my question consistently has been, what is it? What is it that we're describing here? And the closest analogy I have here um, is to a term that actually comes from domestic violence literature, which is coercive control. 
So some might argue that this is a stretch, um, and here I'm drawing on Evan Stark's model of coercive control, and he's a very seminal scholar in the domestic family violence space. One participant, though, who again, um, I'm just not named here, um, she actually drew this parallel herself. Um, and she said after leaving her job, she did go on to work with an NGO that focused on domestic violence and then reflected back on her old workplace. And there she likened the experience with the male principal solicitor to a relationship characterised by coercive control. And coercive control here again is a term used to describe domestic abuse patterns characterised by manipulation and intimidation. It often includes actions like isolating the victim, monitoring their activities, restricting their autonomy, controlling their appearance, degrading their self-esteem, um, as well as other things like financial control, jealousy, possessiveness, and sometimes threats and uses of violence. So in an employment context, some, might, uh, some of these behaviours might seem routine, like monitoring activities or enforcing a dress code. Um, but for this participant, these behaviours were deeply connected by a thread of control and subordination. So Stark's model of coercive control might again offer some insight here, I think. He argues that controllers use micro-regulations of everyday behaviour, such as how women dress or perform stereotypically female roles to entrap victims. Uh, and he also aligns this with an idea of doing gender, where uh, men often achieve con control through the micro-regulation of women's actions and roles. In this model, the, the performance of masculinity involves controlling others, while the performance of femininity involves deference to men's control. And this particular participant's experiences here, I think, was unmistakably gendered. She felt that her boss would never have treated a man in the same way. She said, for instance, he would never have sat so closely behind another man, breathing over his shoulder while he worked, and the control that she felt here was not only emotional and professional, but, but also deeply physical in this sense as well. And she described feeling just exhausted and burnt out from working under such conditions. And for me, her account reveals that the same gendered rules of tyranny apply in the workplace as they do in the home um, around the behaviours of coercive control. And reflecting on her experience, she actually did liken it to a family. She said he created an environment where the firm was framed as a family and this was used as a way um, of making the mistreatment seem acceptable. So my last thoughts about continuums um, of experiences here, again, gets a little bit more complicated. Several participants wanted to share things that had not actually happened to them, um, but that had happened to other women and even children, um, as often as clients that were seeking protection from male violence through their legal firm. And again, while this clearly did not fit the original scope of sexual harassment, it was a really reoccurring and deeply troubling theme for many of the young women that I interviewed. And I spoke to um, at least three cases um, where women held very deep reservations about whether they wanted to or thought they were capable of pursuing legal practice because of how they were watching women as clients and children as clients um, seeking protection from the law treated by the legal profession. So here I've just put one story on the slide um, instead of a series of quotes from different people, partly because these stories were really hard to capture in short statements, but also because this one in particular really stuck with me and it really stuck with, with the young woman who told me about this. So I won't read it all. <laughs> I'll just try to point to some of the highlighted bits there. So this particular student had been working in the profession for three years. She said that she'd never had any untoward behaviour towards her, but she had this experience of watching um, her mentor, who was a sole practitioner, um, and the way that she was treated. So she said that her mentor did a lot of domestic violence work, um, but also a lot of sexual abuse cases involving young children. And she said she does, she does so many, so many child sexual assault cases. And she said that they were so graphic. And the majority of the cases involved young girls um, making 
accusations around the sexual violence perpetrated against them by primarily older men. So she said this barrister that she worked with, who was a woman, um, was getting a reputation um, because she was a mother, was getting a, a reputation for basically being good with kids. And so her firm kept putting these cases on her table and expecting her to act as the defence for these men who had been accused of sexually assaulting children. Um, and again, the statement she's making here is, you know, that the the sort of thought within the firm was, well, she's got young kids, she knows how to talk to these victims, she knows how to talk to them in a way that is nice but can also make them come unstuck. And then the participant here says, she says, she said to me, solicitors approach her and say, oh, can you please take on this matter because it's a very young complainant, she's a young girl. These young girls have mothers, they'll probably trust you when you're crossing them, just to say cross-examining them. So how can we best do this? And she said it, it ends up, it's almost like it's so weird because her position as a woman and also as a mother of young children is being used by instructing solicitors to try and get these particular clients, as in the male accused, off of these sorts of crimes. And she said, I don't know how you do this with young girls. You've got young girls that are around the age of some of these complainants. And she said that her mentor, you know, had told her many times that, you know, she knows, she knows this and she can't do it and she doesn't want to do it anymore and it's taking a toll on her mental health. Um, and she, she sort of ended by saying that to this day still 80% of her briefs are child sexual assault matters. And she said to me, this was the um, this was the student I was interviewing. She said, it's so bad, it's not right. It doesn't sit right, does it? She framed it as a question to me, again, sort of seeking validation. Like, why does this keep happening? It's not right, is it? Why does this keep happening? Okay, and so here again, nothing really happened. And that's what she begins her, her little speech there and saying, nothing happened to me, okay? Um, except that she learned that the legal industry can and could co-opt her identity as a woman um, and the identity of other women, not to harass her, but rather expect her to use that to cross-examine women and children and trap them into suggesting that nothing really happened to them either. And so this is one of the students that told me after this that she would never pursue legal practice, so she now has a four-year degree behind her that she never wants to put into practice. And finding a way to frame this has been a bit challenging for me. Um, and so some people might just say, you could just call that vicarious trauma. And yeah, maybe I could. Um, but I've been thinking about it through the lens of being haunted, a frame of work that um, is called hauntology, which I just sort of like at the moment. So I'm thinking of the ways that these experiences linger like shadows and become what we might call ghostly matter in the formation of how these women envisage the legal profession and their place within it. And these haunting experiences create a sense of invalidation and injustice that doesn't just fade away. It blurs the boundaries between past and present and maybe what's real and unreal. And so again, to unpack these, I've been toying with this idea of hauntology, which is explored by theorists such as Dorita and Gordon, and I'm sure there's people in the audience who know these people much better than I do. Um, but in short, Gordon suggests that haunting is a unique type of trauma. It's where a past repressed violence disrupts our present reality and it aligns with Dorita's notion of hauntology which examines how ontology it's a bit of a play on words how ontology which is concerned with being and presence is overshadowed by states of non-being and absence so hauntology here draws our attention to spectral traces he says that hover between being and non-being collapsing temporal boundaries and making the past feel this vividly alive and influential what does it mean um, to be haunted by experiences that are not wholly yours, which is still something I'm grappling with here? I think the concept of haunting does provide a frame here to understand how the past and the present intertwine and how something can be present in its absence or absent in its presence. And haunting can be described as a relentless remembering where the past and the future are entangled in a state of unresolved tension. And so the spectre of the women that they witnessed being mistreated in various ways become ever present in their absence and a source of unresolved conflict that impacts them on their present. So hauntology here does not only look back, it looks forward as well, and it involves 
being haunted by futures that do not material materialize sorry and this is a notion explored by the english theorist mark fisher um, in what he calls cancelled futures which i think is a very fitting term for what these young women were describing to me participants are haunted not only by past traumas but also by the impossible futures of their own legal career that never came to be as well as um, the justice and injustice of the women as clients and the children as clients that they would saw. They're embodied in effective experience here, not just responses to deeply stressing events in the present, but a haunting of things that are neither nor be nor present. Things that they replay as a traumatic compulsion to repeat and things that have not yet even happened. And I think this also raises questions for the way that the legal practice and legal firms become infused or haunted for women with these kinds of place memories. Uh, and this is a term used in emotional geography to explore connections between emotion and effect and place. That's as far as I've got with that particular section. So most participants in this study had experienced primarily um, gendered harassment, supporting the contention that a lot of the time harassment assumes a form that has little or nothing to do with sexuality, but everything to do with gender. And there's still a question of how do we make sense of these experiences? They are not all harassment or violence. Some were not even overtly sexual in nature, although they were deeply gendered experiences. Some were not even personal experience, but rather observations, um, forms of witnessing and bearing witness to what others were going through. Yet each was felt as a violation that was simultaneously subjectively troubling and objectively difficult for these participants to name. So in seeking to make sense of the significance of these experiences, I've been drawing on the work of Alcoff and her conception of what she calls sexual violation. And she says there that to violate is to infringe upon someone, to transgress, and it can also mean to rupture or to break. Violations can happen with stealth, with manipulation, with soft words and gentle touches to a child or to an employee or anyone who is significantly vulnerable to the offices of others. Sometimes the phrase sexual violence is used as a metaphor to stretch its meaning and to encompass such events. But Alcock says this is misleading. Violence is not determinative of what we are after. What we are concerned with is a violation of sexual agency of subjectivity of our will and we should also be concerned with the ways in which our will has been formed and so drawing on Alcoff I think I'm also suggesting that sexual harassment is not determinative of what we are after in these spaces the privileging of that form of top-down male female sexual come on image of harassment doesn't provide an explanation for the forms of harassment um, that these women were describing. And much of the time, harassment assumes a form that has less to do with sexual interest and more to do with gender relations. And likewise, the legal model of sexual harassment does little to elucidate the harms that these women described, and a focus on sexual harassment in the workplace fails to consider how modes of violation occurring on a continuum across a life course were serving to normalise problematic workplace practices and support cultures of invalidation. And so again, for Alcoff, contra to the popular focus on sexual violence, which highlights rapes harm as a violence, what is needed is an account of violation, which acknowledges that the harm of violation is that it undermines the survivor's subjectivity or her sexual agency, her will and her capacity to make herself and her world. Alcoff insists that in order to attend to the harm of rape and understand an ethical sexual subjectivity, we must shift the questions that we ask. And instead of asking whether consent, desire or pleasure are present or absent in a sexual encounter, she suggests the most pressing question we have to ask is, do I have the ability to participate in the making of my sexual self? And so for Alcock, this is a deeply normative question. Rather than norming sex in relation to consent, it aims to norm sex in relation to the concept of self-making. So Alcoff's account draws attention to the importance of norming sex for the sake of cultivating a sexual self whose will, freedom, and self-relation are not eroded or deteriorated in encounters with others. 
and asking about the conditions and capacities we have for sexual self-making elucidates the impoverished conditions of sexual life and reminds us um, of the continued urgency of emancipatory visions of sexual agency, particularly for girls and women. And for me, I see clear parallels with that framing and how we might take that and apply it to sexual harassment and what counts as sexual harassment. So drawing on Alcock's work, I would suggest that gendered violation perhaps offers an alternative way of conceptualising the continuum of these women's experiences and articulating the harmful effects that these had on the personal and professional subjectivities and the formation of those subjectivities across personal um, university and professional life contexts. So these violations, again, were sometimes subtle, sometimes overt, but always worked to erode or deteriorate the will, the freedom and the self-relation of the women that I spoke to, pointing to, again, the impoverished conditions across the life force that undermined their ability to participate in the making of the self. So while alcohol focuses on the sexual self, I would consider how this relates to the professional self as well and use this as somewhat of a case study, um, even though it's in the context of the legal profession, to think about the context in which the self is made um, and unmade through violations across the life course. That's as far as I've got with this, with this thought. So at the moment, it's open to any comments that anyone has. Thank you. Is <laughs> Michael? I think that was Michael. Thank you so much, Dr. Gore. We may open to questions now in the room if anyone has uh, a question. We've also had some online coming in from our online participants, so maybe we'll go to those and um, give you time to think. Okay, Badra, what have we got online? Um, uh, look, thank you, messages. In addition to that, the first question is from Laurie. It's comment. It's question. Um, what Laurie says, you have mentioned about Kelly's work, and uh, Laurie is very curious to get that information. She forgot to take it down in her notes. Um, yes, of course. So um, there were two works that I cited um, from Kelly, but the primary one uh, is a book that she wrote. So her name is Liz Kelly. Uh, and I believe it was a book published in 1988. Um, I don't think it was called The Continuum of Sexual Violence, though. Sorry, look at me. I'm having an unprofessional moment. <laughs> I can see the book in my frame of mind. Surviving sexual violence. I didn't have to. I didn't have to Google it and hand it to me. Uh, it, well, yes, it was a 1988 book written by Liz Kelly called Surviving Sexual Violence, um, and it was actually based on her doctoral work, which was uh, you know quite a long time ago. But it's uh, it's an interesting piece of research because of how long it stood, you know, in terms of the test of time. Um, so people have it's really experienced an upsurge, I think, in the last few years, where people are taking the idea of a continuum of sexual violence and reinvigorating it um, in new ways. Um, but I'm really happy. Um, was it Mark? Was it Mark that asked me? No, that? Laurie. Laurie, sorry. Um, I'm really happy, Laurie, if you'd like to email me and I can send you the, the bibliographic details of that particular book. Thank you. Archana Death lot of, got a lot of comments and some questions. So I think it is better, Archana, unmute and ask directly. Yeah. Uh, Hello, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I had a few comments and questions. Um, they're more general, I guess. Some of it might be repeating what you've said. Um, what I put in chat was that I felt there's a great ignorance in some parts of the male population on what is actually defined as sexual harassment if not ignorance, then the pressures of male conformity on what is considered the norm for male behaviours and harmful ideas on how a male's personal identity 
should be constructed by disregarding and abusing women. And my understanding is that this is a wide spectrum of behaviours ranging from the everyday intrusions that get dismissed as casual behaviours to the extreme. Um, however, if the casual behaviours are not stopped in the early stages, this can lead to what is considered the accepted norm in a workplace. And these casual, initially less harmful behaviours may evolve into what is harmful. My question is whether the definitions of less harmful, um, everyday casual harassment behaviours have been made explicit. For example, more examples given on the nature in the, of these in some sort of code of conduct policy or code of ethics and whether this is more broadly advocated for use in the workplaces by a council of legal professionals or maybe other professionals as well. Um, in reference to the interviews that you carried out with women, the qualitative research um, as well as other interviews that may exist on this topic. I thought that perhaps the behaviours identified could be mapped to an index of unacceptable behaviour, so global mapping from many studies that could be listed in and advocated in codes and policy. And my other comment was that there should be a unit or subject for law students on this sort of organisational cultures and behaviours that should be nurtured in workplaces um, and more programs for men. I, I take all of those as great comments. <laughs> I don't think there's anything that I can speak more to there, actually. Um, I do think it's interesting that uh, the young women I was... Uh, was talking to who when I asked them about the conversations that had come up around this in uni in university and in their course there wasn't a lot which is exactly what you're saying right should there be something um that helps them you know prepare and develop a critical language for this um and rather the opposite a lot of them um said that they felt like, you know, any conversations around this were framed through the very black and white lens of the criminal law. Um, and, of course, behind that black and white lens is a very phallocentric positioning where much of it is taught from the perspective uh, of finding ways to defend somebody who's been accused of these particular crimes. So it is often framed as a, a defence um, of, of a male accused, and they said that that's how primarily it was taught. It wasn't about how they might encounter this, how they might ethically navigate this. It was if you see a client who's accused of this, what's the legal definition and what are the ways that you would, you know, disprove that their behaviour fits that. So they, they were definitely saying that there's some problems with the ways that they were encountering those, those early conversations. Um, Otherwise, I, just, I think you, you sound like you know as much about this as I do, but what I really took from your comment... No, I found it really about... interesting, and I think all this research will be very useful in the future for, um, you know, creating policy for advocating the rights of women more broadly, not just in the workplace, and, yeah. I really hope so. <laughs> That's the ideal. That's the ideal form of impact, isn't it? Um, and I think for me, even in the, the the interviews themselves, it was interesting to talk to participants around helping them find language to describe things that they had experienced. That they again, they knew it made them uncomfortable. They knew it didn't sit right, but they knew they knew it didn't sit with the definitions around harassment that they'd been schooled to apply to other people. And so when you turn that framing back inward on self it becomes a way of invalidating the self as well. So I think there's, there's definitely a lot of work to do um, in validating across a life course the experiences of people who who encounter these these modes of violation and developing a language. And like you said, sort of mapping process that shows these broader spectrums of behaviours um, and frames it through ethics. I think there's still a lot of work to be done in those spaces. Thank you for your comment. I'd love to talk to you more. <laughs> I can't see you in the camera, but... Uh, thanks, Ashley. Thank Kate you. comments that it's a really interesting findings 
And Nicholas got a question. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Are there any reforms in the recent past or near future that hold a promise? Uh, yeah, so in this field, there's been a lot of international attention as well. The International Bar Association did a big review globally on sexual harassment in the legal profession. And so, of course, that was taken up um, by different sectors in the Australian legal sector as well, as well as the Human Rights Commission, which, you know, we know has been doing extensive work around sexual harassment in the workplace. So there's been a suite of attempted reforms sort of here and there. Um, my feeling about a lot of those is they tend to rely on formal reporting pathways. And again, that misses the types of women I was talking to who didn't feel like their experiences fit legal definitions of sexual harassment. And so they wouldn't have even considered a formal reporting channel. For them, it was more a conversation around broader workplace ethics and ethics across, you know, different spaces in their life as well. So there's really important work being done, you know, across the spectrum of workplaces in Australia and globally to address sexual harassment. I guess my thing just is we need to expand the conversation, um, much like the last um, person asking the question suggested, to highlight that on a spectrum of behaviours, we see these things that become legally defined as harassment but the lead up behaviors to these that are seen as quite normal often fall under the radar. Uh, and so I think there's educational and sort of ethical work that still needs to be done there that's not maybe being tackled in the formal um, workplace reforms around how we deal with sexual harassment or once we acknowledge that something is sexual harassment and can be legally defined as sexual harassment. Jackie Oldman says, thank you for your work, Ashley, and sharing your findings in this way. In my own work, there is quite a lot of overlap with women and gender diverse academics experiences in Australian higher education. Jackie is from School of Education. Hi, Jackie. I think I've met you before, actually. I think we're both with Sega. Yeah. Hi, Ashley. We have great presentation. I really appreciated it. And there is one more question from Laurie. Laurie, do you want to unmute and Ask. Lori, are you there? Yeah, sorry. I I was just curious, um, Dr. Ashley, thank you for the great presentation, by the way. Um, and thank you for the um bibliographic details of the of Kelly's book. I was just wondering about the interview recruitment. Um, were there any challenges given that this is still considered a sensitive um, topic within the profession or or what you mentioned is still an emerging discourse? Were there any challenges in terms of the interview recruitment? Just curious. I actually, well, the other challenge for me was the time frame in which I had to do it, to be honest. Mm. Um, and that's more, that's more a personal story, if I'm honest. I did this research as an early career research grant um, and I was approved for the grant and then I found out I was pregnant and then I took a maternity leave and then I came back and hit the, round, the ground running and had to spend the money in five months. Um, so that was the challenge in terms of recruitment. In terms of, of having people willing to come forward, I have to say I've never actually had um, an issue in getting bums on seats, so to speak. Um, oh, it's great. one of the unfortunate realities of this space. I think one of the reasons, that the women were interested in coming forward is the way that it was framed. Um, and I was quite clear in saying that I was interested in their perception um, around sexual harassment. So I was trying to couch it in terms where I wasn't saying, I don't need you to prove that you were sexually harassed. I don't need you to show me how it fits within this specific definition. I'm interested in your broader perception. Um, about what sexually harassing behaviour might look like um, and how your progress, you know, through law school or through that profession has been impacted. And I think what that allowed in practice is a lot of um, sort of young women who felt like they had been invalidated, which was such a big thing in the presentation, to come to an interview and feel a sense of invalidation with someone who they already sort of thought, based on the project description, would be receptive to what they had to say. And so for me, I think grounding work like that in a feminist ethics that is very concerned with validating survivor experiences, it does sort of mitigate for me part of those challenges or the worry that, you know, what if people don't come forward or want to talk? Um, I have to say that there's always women 
I've found who want to come forward and, and talk about these types of experiences. Thank you for that. It's how you frame the, the question. And then that's really important. Yeah. 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 yeah thank you. Um, we have Michael Brogan in the room with hand up. If you have a question, Michael, feel free to unmute. Uh, thank you very much. And I wanted to thank uh, Ashley for a really interesting presentation. And I'm looking forward to uh, incorporating uh, hopefully the results published in a paper uh, with students that I teach. Um, just in relation to the bearing witness slide, sort of two or three from the end, I wonder whether you've in, um, examined the impact of criminal law practice, regardless of gender, on those who represent an accused person or sometimes a clearly acknowledged guilty accused person in the circumstance you were talking about. Mm. Because yeah. I just wonder whether that dissonance between representing a client and going home at night and thinking, you know, more broadly about the ethics of it all is something that's uniquely gendered or not. I think that's a really interesting question. And those are questions I've asked myself. Um, and I have even made notes to myself that that is a research project I would like to springboard into if I ever get the opportunity to expand on this, to talk to people in criminal law where it is their, you know, primary job to be defending accused of, yeah, these sorts of things. Um, and to think about the dissonance and the ethical challenges and the forms of vicarious trauma or whatever you want to call it that it raises for them. Um, and it's a good question because I don't know to what extent it's gendered. I think it would be very much impacted by situational and intersectional factors for any particular person. But it would be really interesting to explore what that looks like. Yeah, look, I've got a particular interest in that because I come at it from the uh, legal ethics perspective and I teach this and I talk to students about it and if clearly there's a real disjunct between, you know, what they can do and what they think is right. Um, so I think we just need to recognise that the... Uh, process um, is one which I think is psychologically uh, difficult. Justine's put in the chat that Abby Smith has got some scholarship on this. Abby Smith really looked at the rationale for why you do it as opposed to um, the personal impact. And I would really like to talk to you about uh, research in that area in the future. I think that would be really, really great, Michael. Um, and just one quick um, response. Uh, is it Achana? I hope I pronounced that correct. Um, in, uh, yes, it is. Yeah, Archana. Archana, thank you. Um, in the law degree, we run a subject called professional responsibility and legal ethics. And although it's primarily looking at the ethical side of things, we do examine sexual harassment and cultural issues. And uh, as a result of what I've heard today, I'm uh, introducing some of Dr. Gore's research into those discussions in the future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds good. <laughs> Well, I'll try and get that paper published there. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, if we have any questions in the room, feel free to put your hand up. I'll come around with the mic. I actually have a question myself. Do you think um, that because these men, the perpetrators that are, you know, perpetuating these behaviours, making women uncomfortable, um, because they are versed in the law, because they're legal practitioners, that they're able to evade, um, you know, necessarily falling into the legal definition, even though they may know that their conduct is not right. It's a possibility. Um, and I think some of the participants that I spoke to, they broached that as a possible issue as well. Um, but they were also very honest in saying that they work um, in a culture in a work culture where hyper forms of regulation are expected. And so it's not just it's not just the wit per se of a potential perpetrator that means that they're sort of bypassing this. It's a broader culture, um, not just in the legal profession, but around neoliberalism and the workplace practices that we're all subject to as well. Hyper forms of surveillance um, can very easily tip into harassment, but can also very easily look like normal workplace practices to keep up no KPIs and manage performance. And so I think it's a coalescence of factors there, but yeah, very, very possibly. 
That makes sense. Well, thank you. I think that's wrapped up our Q&A. If you can all join me in thanking Dr. Gore. Just one more thing. Uh, Jane Mears talks about, uh, she mentions, we need a case study of ex-Attorney General Christian Porter to illustrate this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a comment. Thanks, Jane. <laughs>